Hello. In this episode, I'd like to ponder two questions. Was ancient Egypt influenced by other parts of Africa? Two, what did ancient Egypt look like? And I'd like us to start by taking a closer look at the origin of ancient Egypt. The ancient Egyptian civilization has been said by various historians to have started about 10, 8, or 5,000 years ago. The jury is still out on trying to figure out precisely when it started. What is important to note here is that it is the earliest recorded civilization. It is said to have lasted more than 3,000 years and was divided into two kingdoms spanning 30 dynasties. It is believed to be the oldest of all civilizations. Now, from the earliest and most reliable records found in the Edfu text, which I mentioned in an earlier episode, the area was conquered by Horus, who came there from somewhere south of Egypt. As I stressed in that episode, the Edfu text was carved in stone. It was found in the temple of Horus, the oldest recorded ruler of Egypt in the area that we now know as ancient Egypt. Horus conquered the people he met in the area just as he had vanquished the people he met on his way from, from the south. This king Horus became deified after he died. The place that Horus came from was has originally the place that Horus came from originally has been identified as somewhere around Uganda and Somaliland. I won't dwell on the question of whether or not Horus and his followers were black Africans since I've elaborated enough on the genesis of that debate in the last episode. Please take time to watch that episode if you have not already done so. I just want to add here that apart from the incontrovertible evidence found in the Edfu texts, other archaeological findings and accounts of early historians like Herodotus, a Greek who wrote about the identity of the ancient Egyptians around 450 BC, and other Greeks who were uh, contemporaries all support the idea that the ancient Egyptians were dark-skinned with woolly hair like you and I. So they had to have been of African descent. Reasonable academics agree that over generations, the population of, e of Egypt has continued to change due to waves of migration over several centuries. Even if we were to go by the way the Egyptians identified themselves. They called their country Kemet, which means black land. It was a nation which was culturally advanced in many aspects, such as mathematics, writing in the form of hieroglyphics, astronomy, architecture, the arts, science, technology, and religion. Now, in this, describing the pyramids as he saw them, Herodotus writes that they were built out of polished stones. And he believed that the stones were raised by machines made out of wooden planks. The level of sophisticated calculations that must have gone into the construction of the Sphinx, as well as the Great Pyramids, continues to astound modern mathematicians, scientists, and astronomers. It is believed that the pyramids were positioned to reflect the rays of the sun in exact proportions to the equinoxes and the solstices, and that these were tied to agricultural events such as the time, the time to plant or, or harvest. In the area of writing, the ancient Egyptians developed hieroglyphics, which were a combination of images, syllables, and alphabets, comprising of about 1,000 characters. The cursive version 
of the hieroglyphics was used to write religious inscriptions by priests. They, they, they used it to write on, on, on papyrus, um, the very first kind of paper that, um, uh, that were used to write. Uh, papyrus was made from uh, a plant which grew only around Egypt. So the priests used hieroglyphics to write on papyrus and wood. These priests were also the chroniclers and keepers of records. They were also healers of the sick, embalmers when people died, and they were sculptors, musicians, lawyers, lawmakers, and teachers. As such, they controlled not only the religious, but also the intellectual life of ancient Egypt. Now, at the height of ancient Egypt's glory, in cities like Thebes, there were magnificent mansions built by the wealthy, some of which had as many as 50 rooms. Their mansions were decorated with elaborate paintings, expensive furniture, and sculptures made from bronze, ebony, and ivory, which must have come from um, the African uh, continent. This is also another proof of the interconnectivity between Egypt and um, the African uh, interior. Cities in ancient Egypt had well laid out avenues lined with trees. The magnitude of the pyramids has led some historians to suggest that the only way um, that they could have been built was through slave labor. Um, as such, they concluded that slavery must have been widespread in Egypt. However, other historians who have studied the period, like um, Flinders uh, Petrie, challenge this theory. Flinder Petrie's position is that what was in place in Egypt was a system of surfage, and that this made slavery unnecessary. I believe that what he means by surfage is similar to a system which obtained in most parts of Africa until modern times. Let me illustrate. The Yoruba of southwestern Nigeria practiced the Iwofa system, which though a system of servitude guaranteed certain rights and protections, it was also quite different from slavery. Iwafa was a system of indenture used by the poor to alleviate poverty and sometimes gain apprenticeship. For the wealthy, Iwafa was a source of labor at a time when there was no system of wage labor. It was often contractual and it did not prevent those who served as Iwafa from rising to any level of power. In ancient times, even if people started out as, as slaves, they had the ability to rise to the most prominent positions of authority. Even outside the Yoruba, and there are examples from other ethnic groups. Um, another example is the story of Jaja of Opobo from southeastern Nigeria. Jaja was an Igbo slave. I use the word slave here with a lot of reservation. In spite of having been enslaved, Jaja was able to work his way, you know, to become the ruler of, um, of Opobo. This could not have been possible under the kind of system of slavery which was practiced in ancient Greece and which later became perfected by U European descendants in the Americas, where it was made more brutal by... Um, by racism. Back to the pyramids. John Jackson proposes that the building of the pyramids in Egypt was a well-organized project which lasted about 10 years just to get the stones to the site. The project engaged a hundred thousand men who worked in three-month shifts to move rocks to the site of construction. The real construction took another 20 years. 
relying on information supplied um, by Herodotus, who is considered as the father of history. Flanders Petri also concludes that with the kind of organization that was in place, the builders of the pyramids were very well organized and managed the project, product, uh, the project so well that they, all they needed to do was to conscript men twice in their lifetime to work for three months at a time during which they earned a decent living and gained technical expertise. Although he does not um, express, uh, does not actually mention women, I think it is safe to assume that some women would have been involved in this project as well. Since we're talking about men being camped for about three months at a time, a hundred thousand men being camped at the building site for so many months at a time, it is safe to conclude that there would have been women as part of the, the camps that built the pyramids. Now, during this period, priests who were very highly educated controlled most intellectual and important aspects of life in Egypt. They were in charge of the manufacture of linen, which we know originated from Egypt, the linen cloth, and any other positions um, in the army that needed a knowledge of arithmetic. They served as royal chroniclers, keepers of records, engravers of inscriptions, physicians or healers, pharmacists, embalmers of the dead, lawmakers, lawyers, sculptors, and musicians. In short, they were in charge of most skilled labor. Imhotep, who I mentioned in the last episode, was held in very high esteem as a vizier, a high official, under Zosa, who reigned between 5,345 and 5,307 BC. Imhotep was an example of how knowledgeable and versatile priests were. He was an astronomer, architect, chief physician to the king. He was later deified as the god of medicine and a temple was erected to his memory in the ancient city of Memphis. John Jackson, another historian, throws more light on the status of slaves in Egypt, in ancient Egypt, by suggesting that in spite of the fact that, the, um, that Egyptian priests wielded so much power, they were generally fair and just. He illustrates that under this system, the punishment for killing a slave was death, and the priests were in a position to exert this uh, punishment. The society was so well organized that private citizens did not need to carry arms, and even soldiers were not allowed to carry arms except when they were on duty. As such, Egypt prospered during the, this period. Another researcher who examined artworks um, that had to do with the domestic life of Egypt during this period was Winwood Reed. He suggests that women in the society were held in high, in high regard and children were very well cared for. And he was able to deduce this, deduce this by reading the artworks of ancient Egypt. We should also compare this to the status of women and children in Europe as recently as the Victorian period. And you see the difference, you know, unlike the women in ancient Egypt, European women um, and children were not very well uh, um, highly regarded. And all you have to also do um, to come to this same conclusion does not even have you don't even have to study history to be able to come to this kind of conclusion if you read novels by writers like um charles dickens um who 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 gave us the story of oliver twist based on 
you know, this, the society in which he lived, you would, you know, you'll be able to also come to the same conclusion that compared to women in ancient Egypt, European women and children were not as well um, cared for. And that the society also did not regard people who, did, who were not wealthy, uh, you know, and did not take as much care of their poor as um, societies in uh, ancient Egypt. So in ancient Egypt, civil laws were properly administered because the poor and the rich could depend on a proper system of justice. This period, which was long before the Greek, Roman, or Arab conquest, is described as Egypt's first golden age. We also need to remember that this was thousands of years before any kind of civilization was recorded in Europe, not to talk of the Americas. Unfortunately, this golden age ended around 4163 BC when Egypt began to experience a decline. In the next episode, we will examine the reasons for the decline of this awesome society. Please watch out for it. Remember to subscribe if you have not done so yet. Like and share this video so that more Africans and people of African descent and really any other people out there who are open-minded enough can have access to what we share here. Thanks for watching and see you next time.